Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the fourth U.S. Leadership Series. We'll call upon the Registrar Dr. Senior Cynthia Senapeglu to give us the opening prayer and the welcome address. Can we please put our hands together for her? Thank you very much. Shall we bow down our heads and have a short prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the gift of life, for our abilities, for opportunities, and for the time to be together here once again. We ask for your special blessings upon our life as we demonstrate our academic abilities that you have so much and graciously endowed us with. We are inviting you into our midst this afternoon. We ask that you will be with us and ensure that this program is successful. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Chairman of Council, Vice Chancellor Convocation, students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I wish to warmly welcome all of you to the University of Health and Allied Sciences. For our first time guests, I extend a special welcome to you. You are currently on the main campus of the university. Our students lovingly re refer to this place as Chinatown. You are specifically in the city auditorium donated to us by the Bank of Ghana. I hope you enjoy your visit to this rising giant called UHAS, and I hope you enjoy the event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, today's session will be chaired by the Vice Chancellor, Professor John Owusu Japon. It's my singular honor to present to you the Vice Chancellor of the University to open the lecture and to introduce to you the presenter for today's lecture. Thank you very much. Chairman of Council, members of Council present, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, all protocols observed. Togbeo, Mamao, you are all very much welcome to today's session. It is my singular honor to introduce the subject matter for us to be able to understand why we are all here. This is the fourth U.S. Leadership Lecture Series instituted in honor of the late John Evans Atta Mills. I want to welcome you all once again. I welcome you all once again for, to today's session. Why these lectures? Our forebears thought it wise to institute these lecture series, primarily to inculcate leadership skills within our university community, to ensure that there is a mentorship system and also an opportunity for our health professionals to develop their capacity in various works of life. And more importantly, as an academic environment to ensure that there is debate, which would hopefully help us reflect on our core values and ethos, which are innovation, integrity, excellence, and service and care. These lectures are usually instituted to acknowledge people's contribution to a certain environment, to recognize them 
honor them and celebrate their work and hopefully maintain or protect a legacy that has been instituted. All over the world, such lectures do exist. And within our Ghanaian academic environment, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences has the Kwame Nkrumah and the J.B. Dankwa Memorial Lectures. KNUSC has the R.P. Bafo Memorial Lectures. UCC has the Kwame Nkrumah Lectures. UDS has the African Leadership Lecture Series. And here in UHAS, we have the Leadership Lecture Series in honor of J.E. Mills. Who is J.E. Mills? J.E. Mills, born in Takwa in the central, in the western region. Is it western north or western? It's western, okay. Now, now I don't know which direction sometimes, the, the lines are, okay, so Takwa is in the western region. Of the third, he was the third president of the fourth republic. Efanti from Utuam, in the central region. He was educated at Achimota School. He did his O-level in 1961 and his A-level in 1963. He went to University of Ghana, got an LLB degree in 1967, then went to the London School of Economics and had an, LL, an LLM in 1968. After that, he went to SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he obtained a PhD in 1971 with his thesis on taxation and economic development. He spent 25 years in academia, uh, where he rose to the rank of an associate professor uh, in the Faculty of Law of the University of Ghana. And he also taught in the Ghana Law School. He had the opportunity to be a visiting scholar in several places. He was a Fulbright scholar at Stanford in in the US, he went to Temple Law School in Philadelphia. He had two opportunities there uh, where he visited as a scholar. He went to Leiden also as a visiting scholar for a period of uh, three years intermittently. And then at, he had several short terms also at the LSE, his alma mater. And then in uh, 2001, uh, he was at British Columbia, University of British Columbia, for another opportunity. And actually, this was the first time I met him. I went for a meeting in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, and everybody was saying, your vice president is coming. Your, and I said, who is coming? And, and uh, they were surprised I hadn't met him before. So that was the, opportunity, the first time I got the opportunity to, to greet and shake the hands of uh, Professor J.E. Mills. And the reason why I remember it so vividly is that that was when 9-11 occurred. And we were both marooned in British Columbia for a couple of days before we could get back. So why J.E. Mills? For the U.S. Leadership Series. He's an academic, he's a statesman, he's a political leader, but when I read the reasons from the council minutes that uh, actually instituted this lecture series, the primary reason was for his role in the establishment of the University of Health and Allied Sciences. So that is why we are here. So somebody envisions, and then others have to take forward. So we had Act 828, establishing the university in uh, 2011. We have now moved ahead, we've developed our statutes, we are growing, we have a strategic plan ready to guide our efficiency as a university. We are supposed to have 11 academic units as per Act 8 to 8. As we speak now, we have seven of them operational, and we have another three in the pipeline, which are going to take off very soon. And then hopefully, I've been told I should leave something for the next vice chancellor to come and do. So I'll leave the Institute of Medical Education for the, the next vice chancellor to come and do. Yeah. So we are a small place. We have 
uh, this beautiful School of Basic and Biomedical Sciences. So this is just one out of our 11 academic facilities. And we are very hopeful that things will change very soon. You heard of the donation of uh, the CD Auditorium by Bank of Ghana. We have our central laboratory in the works. They are getting ready to roof. Uh, our pharmacy block is also being roofed now. Our School of Public Health in Hohoi has also been reactivated and contractors are on site. So we are building bit by bit. This is our 700 acre land on this campus. So everything you have seen so far is in this yellow area. So you can imagine what you'll be seeing in the next couple of years. And we have a small student's hostel over there and a couple of uh, houses for our staff. This year, the central administration will be built. And our school of nursing and midwifery will also be built. And it will become a proper Chinatown. Because this is also a Chinese donation. So, as Plato says, you should never discourage anyone who continually to make progress, no matter how slow it is. We are making progress bit by bit. Just back into memory lane. Our first lecture was held in July 2016 and was delivered by Professor Samuel Kofi-Safadede. And the theme was higher education and its impact on development. The year after, we have Dr. Delano Dovlo, who happens to be here, uh, who spoke to us on the people who work for our health. I must say that uh, Professor Safadede sent his apologies uh, because he's in Japan at the moment. He's unable to be here, otherwise he would have been here. And uh, we have Dr. Dovlo here with us. Then last year, we had a lecture on universal health coverage in Africa uh, that the regional director of, of health for the WHO region was supposed to deliver. Unfortunately, he could not make it, so he sent two people to come and deliver his lecture. So Dr. Martin Otta and Owen Kalua came over to deliver the lecture. So this is the fourth lecture. And uh, this is the man who is going to give this lecture to us, Professor David Hurst Molyneux. David is from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine in the UK. He is a biologist and a public health veteran of over 40 years of experience. A senior professorial fellow and an emeritus professor in neglected tropical diseases. David. <laughs> he is blushing because he didn't know I had this. <laughs> he had his MA and PhD in Cambridge. Then he had a DSc at Salford University, also in the UK. Sorry. David's research is into parasites and vectors. And uh, he enjoys the parasites and the vectors. From trips to leash to onco to elev to guinea worm and malaria. So I don't know how many of you saw some of these traps. Uh, he can speak to them in his sleep. Positions that he has held, he's held so many positions. He was a chair and professor of biological sciences at Southall University for about six years. Then he became the dean of science at Southall University for uh, about eight years. And then he moved to the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. They don't have hygiene. Our school has hygiene. The Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And uh, he was director there for another 10 years. From where, within the same school, he became the director of the Lymphatic Filariasis and the Support Center uh, for about eight years before he retired. 
David has so many honors to his name. The Royal Society of Tropical Medicine, he was once the president. The British Society of Parastology, he's been president. Uh, he's won the Manson Medal, the Chalmers Medal, the Mary Kinsley Medal. I can name so many of them. I think this is the British Society uh, or the Tropical Medicine, one of them. Recently, in 2017, he won the David Kielem uh, Medal for Neglected Tropical Diseases jointly with Dr. Mwele Maletela, who is currently the director of NTD in WHO Geneva. Even the Royal Society of Physicians have acknowledged him. So this is an acknowledgement from the Royal Society of Physicians. He's not a physician, he's the biologist. So for the Royal Society of Physicians in the UK to acknowledge him speaks volumes. So Georgetown have given him uh, an honorary doctoral degree and he has so many of them. His scientific output is par excellence. He has over 400 peer-reviewed publications edited books on control of human parasites, and several policy documents which have affected life in the world all over. And he has also supervised over 50 PhDs, some short, some tall. <laughs> His global input, the African program on Kosakasis control, the Task Force for Eradication of Diseases, Guinea Worm Eradication Commission, Global Alliance for LF, European Foundation on Initiatives for Neglected Tropical Diseases, and several WHO committees. His work on Guinea Worm has taken him all over. This is some photos from Nigeria, and uh, he's been on the commission that is looking at the eradication of Guinea Worm. David enjoys field work, and he goes out everywhere. And, actually gets involved and gets his hands dirty, as we may say. It's only in the field that you get David to sit with somebody wearing a Chelsea t-shirt. <laughs> I wasn't sure he was going to be able to deliver his lecture today because Man U left, lost last night. David is an ardent fan of Man U. And, uh, And I, I was privileged to go to uh, Old Trafford and watch a game with him in one of the presidential boxes. Uh, That's one of our experiences I'll never forget. So if David can wait till Sunday, his flight is on Saturday, but if he could wait till Sunday, I'll take him to the presidential box at the whole uh, sports stadium. <laughs> But unfortunately, his ticket is already booked for Saturday, so I don't know what he can do. But he, he, he brought me some paraphernalia, which is very unlike David, to carry such material. He is a regular family man. He's married to Anita, and they have two adult children amongst themselves. And uh, that is David with his son and daughter and their spouses all together. David enjoys having fun. <laughs> so if there is an opportunity to have fun and there are such huge champagne bottles around, I'm sure David will be very happy to uh, be the barman. On that note, I want to welcome you all to this evening's session and uh, hope that we'll have a good time.
Chairman of the University Council, Vice-Chancellor, traditional chiefs and elders, pro-Vice-Chancellor, registrar, deans and directors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, but above all friends. I am truly honoured to be invited by you, has to give the fourth in this series of, of lectures. I've never had two introductions uh, as I've had in the last few minutes. One from your Vice-Chancellor, particularly embarrassing. <laughs> Worried in the extreme, I think. And then from this wonderful group of dancers and drummers. In researching this lecture, I obviously looked at the name of Professor John President Mills. And as Vice Chancellor has indicated, he had a distinguished academic career, but followed that by an equally impressive political career. Because looking at Wikipedia, which is of course the source of knowledge, Mills made some remarkable contributions to the social and economic development of Ghana. He said, and I quote, if Ghana is a model of growth, it's not translating into something the people feel. And this is particularly interesting in the context of Ghana's position in the world growth indices over the last few years, where its growth has been comparable with India and China. As president, he initiated the exploitation of offshore oil. He sustainably reduced inflation in the country and stabilized the CD, and initiated many economic reforms. But in the field of education, he provided and initiated free school uniforms. He provided laptops. He initiated school feeding programs. And he initiated free tuition for teachers pursuing distance learning to further their studies. He created this institution and the University of Energy and Natural Resources in Bronga Hafo. That is some legacy. It's a great privilege, therefore, to feel an association, not only with the institution, but with the social legacy President Mills left. He was a keen supporter of sport, and I had to inform the Vice-Chancellor an hour or so ago that he was also a fan of Manchester United. <laughs> that may be his only mistake in the eyes of the Vice-Chancellor. However, what I saw in reading in Wikipedia his achievements, I then reflected, and the words were used, vision and leadership, what seemed to me the great contrast to what we in my country are currently suffering at the present time. A lack of political vision, leadership, ability to collaborate, and worst of all, a lack of charisma. So I applaud this lecture series and the legacy and vision that it imbues in this institution. So I'm really privileged to be able to take the floor here. And I did also mention to the Vice-Chancellor that I shared a platform with him in a hall almost as big as this in Cape Town. And I have to say, we had a much less number in the audience than I have today. Uh, I think it was difficult for actually us to spot anybody in the audience. 
because the hall was so big. But I'm truly grateful to everybody who's here and have made a journey. And I say friends in particular because there are many people who I've been privileged to work with uh, in the last 20 years or so, probably 40 years, uh, because um, I've shared with them uh, great times together and I think those times have been reflected in significant progress on the topic I'm going to address. Now I've talked often about neglected tropical diseases in the recent past and I've titled this The Evolution of a Paradigm in Health and Development and I've been assisted on the route by many people. One of the people who really gave us the greatest encouragement is in the audience and that's uh, Dr. Azamoa Barr, who really was the driving force within the World Health Organization for pushing this agenda. Now, what I want to do to start with is look at what I think is really important in any area, and actually what Pre President Mills' experience and example gave, and that's a momentum and building from evidence to policy and then implementing that policy. Uh, this is for a group of neglected diseases of poverty which have become to be known as the neglected tropical diseases. Sorry, I'm just going to find the right way. Now, out of frustration in the early part of 2000, 2002, when the Millennium Development Goals had identified uh, a key target, which was the control or elimination of malaria and HIV, I was involved with some of these parasitic diseases, which you'll hear about over the next hour or so. Uh, these diseases were essentially ignored, and they were basketed by the UN uh, as other diseases. And they included, actually, quite important diseases. In a, whilst malaria and TB were highlighted, even malaria and HIV were highlighted, even TB was not. Um, in 2000, the Global Fund was established again through the vision of the great Garnet and the late Kofi Annan on the advice of Jeff Sachs. And that was a financing mechanism to support implementation of programs on malaria, HIV and tuberculosis. But in frustration I created this slide showing aliens approaching planet Earth and asking them what three diseases were on the planet, and only three were there, malaria, HIV, and TB. And I felt that resonated for some of the other diseases that affected many hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people on the planet. Hence this slide, which has resonated and been used before. However, in 2015, whilst we had made significant progress, I attended a meeting at the Gates Foundation, chaired by the editor of Lancet, Richard Horton, and somebody from WHO said, we're experiencing an epidemic of, of neglected tropical diseases. And I stopped and said, sorry, it's not an epidemic. Whilst we do get epidemics of NTDs, this is a pandemic. Why a pandemic? And why a chronic pandemic? Because these are chronic infectious agents, but they're right across the world, the tropical world, but expanding into the sub tropics and the temperate world. And so we used that title in a review in The Lancet at uh, the beginning of 2016. I believe this is a pandemic because of the scale. Whilst we've made significant progress, many people still are afflicted. Now for those of you who don't know what these are, and I recognize there are many in the audience that uh, won't recognize the names of these diseases. We have diseases like filariasis, which the vice chancellor's worked on, and river blindness or onchocerciasis. Uh, these diseases were common in this country. Indeed, the middle or center photograph was taken in a village called Azubendi here of a, of a blind person helping to make a roof for a local house because they were committed to helping the community despite the fact they were irreversibly blind. Now, I want to play credit to the Vice-Chancellor because this momentum, this movement towards neglected tropical diseases 
has been based on the work of people like Professor Jaipong over the last 25 or 30 years. Because without that evidence base from their work, and particularly in northern Ghana, we would not have been in the position we're in today of having achieved a huge amount. We can look back and say, as I will tomorrow, in 2000 we would not be expected to be where we are today. But in 2000 we wouldn't have started this had it not been for the work that uh, Professor Jayapong undertook during his PhD. So there's a basis of strong scientific evidence that goes into all these programs, allowing us to develop policy and then see that policy implemented. And I do not believe that either of us would have said in 2000, there have been seven billion, billion cumulative treatments for this condition over the last 20 years, and some 500,000, sorry, 500 million people are treated every year. That is a huge public health success. On this, Dr. Azamobar, or AB as I prefer to call him, will recall probably very clearly leaving Berlin Airport in April 2005, when as Assistant Director General, he promised to establish a department for the control of neglected tropical diseases. And his legacy has been enormously successful in producing documentation highlighting the importance of these diseases with the leadership of WHO, not only with AB, but also with his Director General, Margaret Chan. Without that leadership, without that partnership, the NTD community would not be where it is today. Now, NTDs, and there was a debate in Berlin about what we call these conditions, and the consensus became neglected tropical diseases. We needed what I've described as a brand. Why? Because some 20 diseases with names which the public don't recognize is extremely difficult to sell. Schistosomiasis, onchocerciasis, trematodiasis, neurocystosicosis. That does not re resonate. It doesn't resonate with the public. It doesn't resonate with the donors. And so NTDs have now become a brand. Indeed, such is the case that I'm going to give a lecture in the London School of Hygiene next month where somebody's used the title, what do you need to become an NTDologist? That scares me a bit. But I want to look at the brand. I put on the top slide here brands which I would be very surprised if none of you in the audience are not familiar with. Every one of those is in your head. NTDs in 2005 were in nobody's head. We needed to create a brand and the NTD brand has actually generated a lot of money and a lot of interest. And I just want to reflect on what makes a brand. And before doing so, I want you to think about what happened to Volkswagen when they had the emissions scandal and the issues over diesel emissions and being fixed by their software. That did enormous damage to a brand. And this slide comes from Harvard Business School, and it shows you, sorry, it shows you what the importance of reputation is, what the issues of relationships are, what the experiences of a brand are, and how the symbol of the brand is associated with values and identities. And I think that's what we've been able to achieve with the neglected tropical diseases. But environments change, and what has happened since 2015 has been the UN and the member states of the United Nations have embraced the Sustainable Development Goals. And so for me, given the links between neglected tropical diseases and 
the Sustainable Development Goals, across the patch. Working with colleagues in WHO, we identified where the cross-cutting issues were between these diseases and the interventions for these diseases and the targets for the Millennium Development Goals. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, education, gender and equality issues, water and sanitation. I just use those as examples because the achievement between 2015 and um, now is that the neglected tropical diseases are specifically mentioned alongside malaria, TB and HIV as one of the health targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. And if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals and the link with NTDs, you'll see that poverty and NTDs are closely aligned. There are issues of food security and improved nutrition if these diseases are controlled. There are issues around education, there are issues around gender and equality. Access to water and sanitation is critically important for arresting transmission. There are issues around development of cities and urban areas. There's a very close link between climate change and these infections. And there's issues around halting biodiversity loss because of the impact that has on vectors. And above all, perhaps, the issue of partnerships is critically important, which I'll talk about a little later. But the common features of these infections, they're not all infections, by the way, but the majority are. They're a proxy for disadvantage and poverty. People who have neglected tropical diseases cannot work effectively, and therefore they cannot earn. The populations often have low vis visibility. They have limited political voice beyond the end of the road. Their clinical symptoms cause disability, stigma, often social isolation, social isolation and have an impact on mental health, not only of the individuals, but also on those who have to care for the afflicted individuals. They have an under impact on morbidity and mortality, compared with many conditions they're neglected by research. But we know they can be controlled, eliminated and possibly eradicated. And Ghana is an excellent example of what we've achieved over the last 20 years. And using the former director of the Onkosakasis program in Ouagadougou, Uchi Amazigo. She said, these diseases shackle the world's poor in poverty. They exist where there are no roads, no doctors, no drugs, where you have the least food security, incomes are lowest, health information is the least, but where the need is greatest. So if we can do something about that sector of the population who are the most vulnerable, the least access, to services, then we can make a big difference. Now, without boring you with names, you can go to this lecture on the website, um, the chronic pandemic. These are the 20 diseases which WHO now lists as the neglected tropical diseases. Three have recently been added, snake bite, mycetoma and scabies. But I'll just mention snake bite because that is a huge problem, and I know it's a huge problem in this country, uh, because I was in Kumasi with Professor Phillips two days ago, and in northwest Ghana, there are major problems of snake bite, and the Kofi Annan Foundation has now put that amongst its priorities. 100,000 people a year die of snake bite, and I'm coming to that in this slide. One of the Major drivers of health policy is the global burden of disease estimates developed by the Institute of Health Metrics in Seattle. This is often regarded by WHO as a biblical text. Um, and I like the ability to challenge some of these issues. But in 2010, the attributable number of deaths 
to these diseases was 152,000 a year. That doesn't appear many in global terms. And it's only 1% of the global burden of disease. In comparison, though, in Africa and South Asia, the problem is 900 times greater. But the deaths attributable to these diseases by the global burden of disease Sorry, is that still on? No, it's not going. Hello? Hello? Oh yeah, let's put it back. Uh, I'll try it. The deaths associated with cancers generated by worm infections and bilharzia or schistosomiasis of the order of 20,000 a year. It may be a gross underestimate. There is a huge burden of depressive illness associated with these conditions. Injuries, interesting because rabies, viruses you acquire from mad dogs, and snake bite are classified as injuries. And the total number of deaths per annum in that group are the order of 155,000. Neurological conditions, epilepsy caused by a tapeworm parasite, they represent some 20,000 deaths a year. This condition, called neurocystosicosis, is estimated to be responsible for 30% of global epilepsy cases. But none of these in red are included in the calculations by the Global Burden of Disease Study. Yet they're due directly to infectious agents or snake bite associated with these diseases. So we think that we need an agenda for 2030, that we have to see these diseases not just in terms of individual disease eradication, but through the lens of poverty alleviation, strengthening health systems, universal health coverage. And WHO has said that progress towards their control and reduction in prevalence and morbidity can be a good marker for success in achieving sustainable development goals because of the impact these diseases have across the plethora of the sustainable development goals. The other issue is innovation. Um, I want to emphasize, and I'll make the point in a minute, that innovation is not about people in white coats in laboratories developing drugs and diagnostics. These only develop over a long period of time. We're talking about decades. As the time scale, as I make clear in the next bullet, the time scale to development of new products is often decades as opposed to years. There's an importance of issue around advocacy and linking to comorbidities with malaria and HIV. But we've made the economic case because I believe, and I hope I'll show you in a minute, that the evidence is that this is the best buy in terms of health dollars spent. And one billion people a year are being treated with essential drugs. But you always have to expect the unexpected, as I'll demonstrate. Now, what I also want to show in this slide, and it's deliberate that the cogs go round, because there is a link between all these issues. If you look in the top corner here, I refer to disablement, social stigma, lack of marital prospects for people who are disabled or disfigured. The fact that they become dependent on the community may have reduced longevity. They become a burden on carers with a loss of income. There are direct costs of medical care, particularly if that medical care is inappropriate and dr it drives people into what is described as the medical poverty trap. And if there's permanent poverty, there's no income. That impacts on children's educational performance because fees can't be paid for school. And reduced access to education has lifelong consequences. 
in terms of agricultural productivity so important in rural areas, an inability to harvest crops or the lack of the ability to grow cash crops has a significant impact at the level of the household economy but also in reduced nutritional status. So all these things are interactive. You can't pin one particular cause to an effect. Now, one of the interests of equity, my colleague Bernard Lisa, who Johnny and I know very well in Georgetown, formerly at the World Bank, did a study in 2010 of the amount of official development assistance that was spent on neglected tropical diseases, all of them. And he came out with a figure that only 0.6% of official development assistance was allocated to these diseases, despite the fact that at least one billion people are infected. I think that's a very good example of gross, gross inequity. Um, in 2013, for the first time, the World Health Assembly, the governing body of WHO, its member states, endorsed the strategy for the control of these diseases and broke it down into five categories. Preventive chemotherapy, which means giving free drugs once a year to eligible populations. Intensified disease management for more complex diseases which need to be diagnosed. Um, focusing on zoonotic diseases, those are diseases which people get from animals. Improving water and sanitation and vector control, controlling the insects which transmit quite a proportion of these conditions. But these programs have benefited enormously from donation of quality assured medicines which are on the WHO essential medicines list. Our calculations are that the value of these medicines is some two to three billion dollars annually, which countries, if they apply for these medicines, can get free. Now, I emphasize quality products because they're quality controlled at source. And the first donations were the donation by Novartis, then Ciba Geigy, for multi-drug therapy for leprosy, followed by Merck and Co, who donated ivermectin for river blindness and later for filariasis in Africa. Other drug companies then followed GSK with albendazole for filariasis and later